welcome again to another episode of Mid American Gardener. I'm your host and Master Gardener intern, Tanisha Shades Fain. We've got a great show lined up for you this evening. Lots of show and tells, and of course, our panelists here to answer the questions that you've sent in. So let's jump right in and have them introduce themselves and tell you a little bit about their specialty and what they enjoy in the garden. So Dave, we're gonna start with you. I'm Dave Plussard from the Garden Center at Hair Nursery in Peoria, and I am a landscaper and an arborist and work with trees and shrubs, so that's my specialty. Wonderful. All right, next. Hi, I'm Karen, and I'm also from the Garden Center at Hair Nursery in Peoria, and I enjoy perennials, shrubs, houseplants. Um, I do a lot with perennials in my own yard. All right, and last but not least. I'm Ella Maxwell. I also work at Hairs in Peoria, and uh, I enjoy a lot of the same things that they do. Actually, I've seen both their gardens. They're wonderful, and I have a large garden too, so I can answer a lot of questions, and I brought some show and shares. Awesome, you brought the whole team tonight. We've got the Peoria team in the house. Okay, yeah. all right, we're gonna get started. Dave, we've got an email question for you. This is from Lori. And she has a question about her tree. I have a blue spruce that is approximately 35 years old in my front yard. It's surrounded by a driveway, the house, and a paved street. A lot of rainwater goes on the concrete rather than on the roots. My question, however, is this. The lower branches have been left on and they touch the ground. I don't know if they're helping to protect the tree or if this is beneficial. Many scrub trees and vines grow up and I figure uh, for the complete moisture in the summer, I can only prune them out in the spring. I love the tree and I like the look. I just wanna know what is best for the tree. So what are your thoughts on that? Well, Lori, I have the same problem that you do. I have a spruce tree that the branches <laughs> hang low, but yet mulberries and some vines still grow up in it. Um, if you want to prune the lower branches off to make it easier to take care of the plant, that would be fine. The spruce really isn't going to be affected by whether or not you have those lower branches on the tree. I personally like the looks of it uh, down to the ground, but nonetheless, it does make it harder to take care of the weeds underneath. But So it's really your call and what you like the looks of the best. So either one, having it full at the bottom or kind of just pruning that up, it, there, it's no damage to the tree at all? Correct, okay. not a problem. So it's just kind of what she, what she wants to do. Right. Okay, awesome. All right, Karen, we're gonna go to you for, for your first show and tell item. Well, I brought, it's that, that kind of that season of the winter time where we start to see a lot of these uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas cactuses in the stores. So I think they're a pretty easy to care for holiday item that doesn't have to be just for the holiday. I picked this one up a few years ago and I actually think I brought it when it was quite young uh, to one of the shows, but I liked it because it was more of a Thanksgiving color uh, since it does bloom sort of early. Uh, last week this was covered in blooms. If you've got a room when it's blooming that's a little bit cooler, the blooms will last a little longer. I've got it kind of in a hot window, but in the summertime I put it outside in the shade and it fills out really well and then I just bring it in before it gets too cold but really to, easy to care for. This isn't a cactus that likes to be really dry. They do like a little bit more moisture, but I tend to overwater, so a lot of times I put them in clay pots so that I, I don't uh, drown it. Any tips for folks who are having trouble getting theirs to bloom? It's, it's more um, day length and then temperature that helps you with that, so it, it'll, it'll go into a bloom cycle in the fall time, in gotcha. the fall winter. Um, my mother-in-law's re-blooms for quite a number of months, quite consistently, mm -hmm. but I think because it's in a little bit of a cooler room, ah. that seems to help that bloom cycle to mm. keep going. Okay, all right, great. All right, Ella, we're gonna move on to you, and you we're talking arts and crafts. <laughs> yeah, I did. I brought a, a craft. Um, this is a small gourd, a small pumpkin, mini pumpkin, <laughs> and uh, you can take fresh leaves with some uh, decoupage and it's kind of back in. This is a great Pinterest idea, but to you just use a little bit of glue and you can glue these leaves down and you cover them. And this one has glitter in it. So it's just a wonderful uh, fall idea. Um, you could probably do it at another time of the year, but just something kind of fun with fresh leaves. So you can do it with little um, uh, leaves from a uh, coral bell, lots of colored foliages in the fall, of course, the colored leaves, and they'll stay for a number of months. 
That's just what I was going to ask if the leaves will stay. I, I've worked with decoupage, but I haven't used real leaves before. So yeah. they don't crumble and uh, fall no, apart on you? No, they don't fall apart. They kind of lose some of their color. This uh -huh. was done a number of, uh, well, more than a month ago. But uh, wow. you can just la add another layer over mm -hmm. the top and uh, keep them for kind of a fun thing. Centerpiece. Sure. All kinds of stuff. Those are really cool. Okay. All right, Dave, we're coming back to you with another tree question. All right. Uh, weeping cherry tree. Deb Quick sent this one in. She says, I have a fairly young weeping cherry tree that's been damaged by deer. <clears throat> this summer we put fencing around it, but the damage has been done. Now there's sap leaking from the wound. Is there anything I can do to promote healing? Well, the tree is going to do most of the healing itself, Deb. If you would keep the tree watered during the summer when it gets dry, it gets hot, that's probably one of the most important things. You can fertilize the tree. That can help. And thank you for sending the pictures in because actually, I'm sorry to tell you, if you look, as you look at the picture of the trunk, you can see that probably 50% of the circumference around the trunk has been damaged. And so it's unlikely that the tree is going to uh, be able to fully recover from that. It's more likely, particularly since it's a cherry, it's, it's probably going to decline eventually. Doesn't mean that you should uh, take it down now. You certainly can take care of it, fertilize it, water it, as I said. But um, in time, it is probably going to decline in our area. Cherries tend not to be a real long-lived tree anyway, so uh, just be aware of that, and uh, that would be your best bet is to, to just take care of it through the watering and fertilizing. Wow. Now, did the deer, is it their antlers? Did yeah, they, they, they rub on they there? I couldn't rub, tell from the picture. Mm -hmm, they rub their antlers on the tree, and, and that's how they damage the bark. Wow. It, it's, a, it's the male deer, of course, and they'll um, return year after year to trees in your yard, so you want to make sure that next year yeah, she yeah. protects it as well. Yeah, she mentioned she did a, a barrier around it. That's what you have to mm -hmm. do to protect the bark from the deer, but yeah, it, it can do some real damage. Wow, okay, and thanks for sending in those pictures. I'll say mm -hmm. that again, because we get a lot of questions about things just like this, and sometimes it's hard for you guys because there's no photo, so right. that really did help. Mm -hmm. Awesome, okay, moving on to you, Karen. We're gonna talk fertilizer. Yeah. Um, what I brought is, um, I had talked on one of our previous um, shows about my endless um, summer hydrangea, and mm -hmm. I called it an endless disappointment summer hydrangea, <laughs> because they just don't bloom for us. But this last year, I did treat it in the fall and in the spring with a triple superphosphate. This is a 0.450 analysis to try to boost a bloom cycle on the shrub. I put it on in the fall, late, late fall, early winter, and then once again in spring, I gave it another application of it. And this past summer, it actually, I, my, my plant did bloom. I had some blooms. It wasn't enough to keep it in my yard. I dug it up and threw it away. But <laughs> for those of you who still have them in your yard, I would highly suggest boosting that, that middle number of that fertilizer for trying to get a bloom cycle on these plants, along with extra winter protection but um, you don't want to just give it regular fertilizer that's going to add nitrogen and you'll just get more of the green leaves that you've had every year okay and just uh, randomly as you were talking i was thinking about when we bring everything in and how to feed them in the winter any of you guys have any tips on how to feed your plants and and keep them healthy while they're indoors do they do you need fertilizer in indoors well typically in the winter time uh, you don't fertilize them generally from um like November to March, for mm -hmm. example, um, probably don't do too much fertilizing because they're already, there's a lot less light, not as much photosynthesis mm -hmm. going on. Um, unless you're in a greenhouse, probably no, you would not do a lot of fertilizing. Okay, that's right. Mm -hmm. I consider mine in plant prison. <laughs> and they just have to make it. They just have to buckle down. And then, <laughs> and then it's a land of plenty again in the spring when yeah. they get to go outside. But it, it is. Dave's right. It's the lack of light. And so you don't want to fertilize if they don't have enough light to be able to utilize that. Oh, good. See, glad I asked because I did not know. And I would have been probably feeding my plants over the winter. Okay, now we're back to you, Ella, with another show and tell? Yes, that's right. I, uh, for all those people that want to have greenery inside, there's a lot of different clamshell 
things that you can recycle from the grocery <laughs> store. And this one right here, I used to, now if I can open it, there we go. I used to create a little mini greenhouse for succulent cuttings. And so at, on the bottom, there's a layer of moist soil. And then I laid a piece of sheet moss on top just to make it look nice, but I had enough little cuttings that I could just make an assortment here. And then since the moisture is locked in, once you close it and snap the lid, you can just set it on a counter and it's going to root during the winter. Um, and I hope to have some really nice succulents that I can tear this apart or maybe actually put it in a larger dish garden. So uh, the other thing that I did that I wanted people to know about with cuttings is I have this beautiful uh, bouquet of coleus. This was taken more than two months ago and personally I find they root so much better in a paper cup. Now as your paper cup begins to deteriorate. You can see that I have four paper cups here. <laughs> but um, you could then just add soil and then you could just tear this cup away. It's so much easier than glass. They don't seem to have that salt buildup. And uh, I'm going to repot this um, for, for the winter. I just had to save it because, you know, once it gets too cold, they can't be in an unheated office. and. Unfortunately, that's what I have at the nursery. Yikes. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, it's almost too cold. <laughs> We're right on the line there. That's right. <laughs> okay. All right, Dave, back to you. And I'm going to butcher this, so please forgive me, everyone. Uh, Chris writes in, I have a Peeve Minaret, sorry, dwarf <laughs> bulb cypress. It's on the northwest corner of my house. Grew very well the first year, slowed down last year, looks very yellow now. What does it need? Well, uh, Chris, I would have a soil test done. Um, it is a soil issue. The uh, nutrients in the, in the soil are not available to the plant, probably because your soil is too alkaline or uh, too high of a pH. And uh, soil test would help determine what your actual pH is or what the alkalinity of your soil is and then you would be able to uh, determine probably need to add sulfur to lower to the pH but how much you add uh, that's why you'd need the soil test done is to tell you what the, the amount of sulfur you need to put on and you might even want to get a micronutrient test done at the same time there there may be a type of nutrient uh, that typical in a soil test, you get have a nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium as a result. But if you have a micronutrient test done, then you will find out if maybe uh, there's one of the nutrients in a lesser amount that is not available, and you might need to add that. So uh, the soil test would be the best thing to have done to find out what you need to add to the plant. And to have a soil test done, uh, you because I don't know where you're at, you may need to Google to find out where to have a soil test done, or you might call your county extension office and they could tell you who does soil tests in your area. Now, should he wait until spring, or is a soil test something that you he, can do year-round? He could year do round? the soil test now, actually, okay. so I'd go ahead and have that done. Yeah, and then you'd know what to do when the time comes in the spring. Gotcha. Okay. Great advice. All right, Karen, we've got an email question for you about purple fountain grass. Um, Dan Sullivan lives in Naperville and wants to know if it is a perennial or an annual. And he said he's been told that he needs to dig it up and store it in the garage or it won't survive. So just wanting some advice there about what to do. Yeah. And it, he's, he's right. It, it is a perennial or an annual. So in our area, in the Midwest, it is an annual because it's only hardy in zone eight to 11, so that's down pretty far south. So it can tolerate maybe down to about 15 degrees. So if you've had some freezing weather, it, it still could be a potential that you could try to, to salvage it. Um, I've never overwintered one. I do have a couple plants this winter. I'm gonna try a couple different methods, but um, a, lot of, a lot of the talk is that cut it down two to three inches and, and then keep it as a house plant to then take it back outside. Okay, all right. 
Ella, to you. Jan on Facebook writes in, when is the best time of year to dethatch my lawn? We have our lawn professionally treated several times a year and our auto mulching mower is set at four inches. It appears that our lawn is full of thatch and she wants to know what to do. Well, I would say, Jan, the best time to dethatch is in the fall. Uh, that way you have less weed competition because the thatching actually will pull out that. It might be easier to aerate, and that's where you would have the plugs pulled out where you have soil that will redistribute itself and it'll be able to the microbes that are in that soil can break down that thatch layer. You can use one of the dethatching things, but it just kind of tears through the lawn, and that might be a good time to think about uh, overseeding. So probably now um, the best thing to do is to follow just really good practices. I think you can mow shorter as we go into winter. I would avoid any spring fertilizer because your grass will probably already go, but grow. And especially if you use a fall winterizer. Uh, myself, I just fertilize in the fall and then in the spring, I just do a uh, pre-emergent weed control, but I don't fertilize because the grass is going to grow anyway. And thatch is um, just the old uh, grass as it grows, it grows from the center out, kind of like your house plants, um, dracaenas and such, and so those old ones fall down. They're usually digested, um, and, and a lot of times you do want some thatch layer. I think, how much do they say? Half an inch, up to yeah, half an inch? Yeah, less than an inch, definitely. Yeah, less than an inch. So. Um, it's probably okay. I think people get overworked about thatch. Any suggestions? Anybody Other? else? Anything else to nope. add? Okay. Okay. Well, that's it. Speaking of a topic that people get worked up about, I want to hear what your take is, the three of you, on uh, leaf raking. Some people are very particular about leaves. Some people say just leave them. It's good ground cover. So, what are you guys? What's your take on on fallen leaves? I'm. Uh, I have a very large lawn with lots of trees. I have lots of leaves. I have a bagger on my mower mm. and I uh, do not, I compost my leaves. So I will collect them and um, mound them up. Um, I don't want to send them off, but I also want to keep them off the lawn and um, mowing them regularly seems to do that. Uh, then over the winter in my beds, it's okay if uh, leaves accumulate. It depends on the quality of your leaf, I think too. Oak leaves don't mat down as much as like silver maples would. They might not be as good, but that's what I do. I keep all my leaf matter. I don't burn any leaves and I don't send any away in brown paper bags. What do you do, Karen? Well, I bring my leaves to your yard. <laughs> <laughs> she does. She does. It's, she set like, you up for that I, one. I take them off the curb for my neighbor, too. Nice. I have a small yard, uh -huh. and, and for me, it would mat down my lawn too much. And so I, I use my mower to kind of suck mm -hmm. them up and to, to, to um, chop them up a little bit, and then I drag them to Ella's house. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what about you? What do you do with your leaves? Well, I'm lucky. I live in the country and a lot of my leaves blow away. Um, <laughs> but uh, I don't rake, I mow, and I mow in a, I have a riding mower, so I mow in a pattern so that I blow the leaves into the tree ring around the tree and actually oh. leave them there mm -hmm. uh, over the winter time as kind of a mulch. So uh, I'm fortunate that I'm able to do that. But um, the problem with not raking the leaves is that it does uh, damage the grass mm -hmm. if it's if they're too thick. If you just have spotty leaves, it's not going to be a big deal. But if, if you have a lot of trees and mm -hmm. a lot of leaves, you're not going to have any grass if you don't rake Interesting. them. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. I don't know. I just, that was on my mind. So I'm glad we talked about it because we got some good information out of that one. Okay, Karen, we have an email for you on shade trees. Uh, Doug and Wendy write in, we're building a new house in rural Peoria County and want to plant fast growing shade trees on the west side to shield afternoon, early evening sun. Would you provide us with suggestions on tree species for our area? 
Yeah, and what, what I think is one thing that they say the land is flat, so that, that concerns me a little bit because out in the open, more country areas, you do have more wind issues. So I would, I would not want to say to plant all fast growing trees because a lot of times some fast growing trees are a little bit more, tend to be weaker wooded. So I would look at your house and where's, where's the most important part of your house to shade? And I would at least do one fast growing tree to help shade maybe this one corner or this one part of the house or this corner or the deck maybe. And then look at maybe mixing in some other trees that are gonna grow a little bit slower. So maybe your fast growing tree, the autumn blaze maple, um, that's a hybrid tree. It's really fast growing, sometimes too fast growing. And then maybe for the other trees, choose something like a, a northern red oak. They grow relatively fast for an oak tree and are now beautiful and stately in themselves. Something slower growing that would give you great yellow fall color, a ginkgo, uh, maybe a swamp white oak for something a little slower growing too. And lately my favorite tree is the um, variety of Kentucky coffee tree called Espresso because it doesn't have uh, fruit pod, the pods on it. Um, that's a medium growing tree, but it's a native tree mm -hmm. and can actually take, um, some of these trees that I've mentioned too, can take some wind. Okay. All the, right. the fastest growing tree in my yard that I planted when we moved in was a tulip tree. Hmm. It's the tallest and then a bald cypress. Oh, good advice. But I didn't plant an autumn blaze, so. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Ella, you've got another show and tell. To talk about? Uh, I do. I uh, when I was here before, um, we they were talking about mason bees, and uh, Phil Nixon took me aside and told me that female nesting sites that the diameter of the hole had to be five sixteenths of an inch. So if I was going to use this bamboo, I guess I'm going to have to drill the hole big enough because if the if it's smaller, supposedly the female will only lay male um, unfertilized eggs. So I want a lot of girl mason bees. I found that fascinating. I'm gonna get the bee book that he showed as well. But uh, just to let you know, you can just drill holes into lumber to create holes for the mason bees, but they have to be more than five inches deep. Otherwise, they can be, uh, uh, there can be different predators uh, that can um, uh, get to the larva before they have a chance to emerge. So we want these bees. Let's talk yes, a little bit yes, about that. These are solitary bees. Um, they're not like the honeybee that's a social communal bee mm -hmm. in a hive. This is a fertile female that will uh, just lay single eggs, maybe several in a tube of uh, from a plant so when you cut back your plants you want to leave at least 10 inches um, for like cone flowers or some of your other perennials so that they have an opportunity that following year to choose them as a nest site interesting and and there are other solitary bees leaf cutter bees um, also uh, some of the different sweat bees it's very interesting and i'm kind of excited about them Okay. You think you can answer a question in less than two minutes? Yes. All right, here we go. Manuel wants to uh, talk about his seven-year-old Italian plum dropping all of, the, all, all of its fruit. He wants to know if this is a pollination issue. Go. It is not a pollination <laughs> issue. It is more likely environmental conditions. The most important thing is proper pruning. Many times there's too much fruit that is set and the tree does not have enough reserves allocated and so it will shed some of that fruit. That could have happened because this Italian prune plum is self-fertile. Also, sometimes you want to use the appropriate spray schedule. If you use something like seven, it can cause fruit abortion. Or if we had hot, dry temperatures, that could also account for all his fruit on the ground and not. So prune, spray, water, you'll have fruit. Okay, and we I'm did sure. have bouts of dry last summer, so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Perhaps that's what he's, perhaps that's what he's seeing. All right, anything else for the good of the order, folks? <laughs>
<laughs> anything that you want to talk about or mention or anything that you're seeing, we've got about a minute or so. So I didn't know if, you know, it's up for grabs if there's anything that you guys want to discuss. Well, I, I just think that you need to make gardening fun. In the fall, yes. there's so many chores. And so you need to, sometimes you're overwhelmed. So you need to break it down, mm -hmm. do it with someone else. It's always more fun with someone else. Involve your children or mm -hmm. your spouse. I mean, it doesn't have to be a gender type of role. Mm -hmm. And um, get out and enjoy it. Now, don't do it on a day that it's 19 degrees but um, <laughs> with 50 mile per hour wind gusts <laughs> exactly but if it's sunny and kind of nice go out for an hour and you can make it part of a walk and you know do a little that's the way i get things done in my three acres and clean your tools right yeah. clean your garden sure. tools mm -hmm. put the hose away do all those things that you need to do to get you to next spring, basically. It's not fun, but... Right, and then come in and you can enjoy garden catalogs. Uh, there there's you go. lots of new books. There you go. Plenty to get you through. Plenty to get you through. Okay, well, that is all the time we've got for this show. Thank you so much for watching. And also, make sure you check out our podcast wherever you podcast. Victoria, this week, talked to Rusty Malding, and they've got some great content on there. So make sure you check out our podcast, and we will see you next time. Thanks so much for watching.